Welcome, everybody, to another wonderful episode of the History of Vestments uh, with Dr. Tulin Wilson uh, presiding. Um, before we begin, though, uh, would Claire Grace lead us in prayer? Sure, I'll be glad to. So today being June 30th, I know that uh, in the Catholic Church, June 29th is the feast day of, the, of Saints Peter and Paul. Um, who, as we all know, didn't always get along real well, um, but um, <laughs> Council of Jerusalem kind of got them to agree on a few things, whether they liked it or not. <laughs> but as we just kind of celebrated that, I chose a prayer from um, Our Lady Queen of the Apostles, the Blessed Mother. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Immaculate Mother of God, Queen of the Apostles, we know that God's commandment of love and our vocation to follow Jesus Christ impels us to incorporate, to cooperate in the mission of the church. Realizing our own weakness, we entrust the renewal of our personal lives and our apostolic to your intercession. We are confident that through God's mercy and infinite merits of Jesus Christ, you who are our mother will obtain the strength of the Holy Spirit as you obtained it for the community of the apostles gathered in the upper room that evening. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, Amen. and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Um, Thank you very much, um, uh, Claire Grace. Uh, so uh, let me introduce um, Dr. Tulin Wilson. Uh, she is the Chief Academic Officer, as well as an online professor of dogmatic and moral theology at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. She also hosts WCAT Radio's Author to Author, a program in which she interviews Catholic authors to assist Catholic readers in identifying Orthodox Catholic content. She is the author herself of two books entitled The Story of Holy Apostles and Survivor, A Memoir of Forgiveness. Dr. Tulin Wilson's doctorate is in sociology from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. After she converted to Catholicism in 1988, she earned a 90 credit MA in theology from Holy Apostles and a licentiate from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, DC. She has been associated with Holy Apostles for 32 years 25 of which have been as an administrator and professor. She has been involved in the academic formation of well over 200 priests and hundreds of lay people and religious. Uh, tonight's presentation is on deacon vestments. Uh, Dr. Tulin, welcome and take it away. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mahfoud. Uh, thank you for the introduction and Grace, thank you for the, uh, Claire, thank you for the uh, opening prayer. Uh, before we begin, uh, Dr. Mahfoud, could you help me so that people could actually see me? <laughs> I, I don't even, at this point, I do not even have the picture of the chapel up there. So I need a little technical assistance. Oh, certainly. I can see you. Oh, all right. That's what matters. As long as they can see me, it's okay that I'm speaking to a blank screen. <laughs> I want to make sure they can see me. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyway, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the prayer. Um, I want to start by answering a couple of questions that came up over uh, the week, uh, especially during the uh, mini lecture last week. And uh, so the first was about the five buttons on the cuffs of the cassock. Um, I spent quite a bit of time researching that question and uh, found out amazingly even more about cassocks. It's uh, quite an area of study. I spent, um, I don't know, a couple of days. Anyway, I finally uh, discovered the bottom line is that some cassocks have five buttons on each cuffs, each of the cuffs and others don't. So I have not yet found the reason for that difference, but I did ask two of my priest friends, uh, both of whom are experts in liturgical matters, including vestments. And they both said they don't know the answer, but that they would get back to me. So stand by, 
Um, and hopefully by next week, we'll have the answer to that question. Uh, I apologize that what I was not able to find it this week. Uh, the second question I received last week was about chapel investments. I believe I received that by email. Um, and the question was, can a lay person uh, wear vestments if they're a chaplain? The answer to the question is in the Catholic Church, chaplains are either ordained men or they are lay ecclesial ministers. Lay ecclesial ministers who are hired with the job title chaplain, okay, they are not ordained, they do not wear vestments. So as an aside, I was searching on the internet and I realized uh, putting in the words hospital chaplain alone uh, can literally lead to some pretty gruesome studies of what can happen to the human body. And I thought of how, uh, how strong and brave the men are, um, you know, the chaplains who go out to uh, see somebody who's, you know, been mangled some way. Um, and they go to help them. Uh, it, gives, it gives me a new respect and a new love of the men who go to the scenes of really horrible accidents to bring spiritual help and encourage people and bless them, anoint them, and give them the Eucharist. Um, so I was, um, you know, I, I'm thankful for that question. because We do now have the answer to that one, but also it gave me uh, a new respect for these men who, um, who really give their all. I do not think there were any other questions that I received that I forgot. Does anybody have any that I should have remembered? Okay, that's good. Okay, so I will be sending uh, Dr. Mahfoud the uh, sources for each lecture. I use quite a bit of sources on the internet. Um, also some books, and that way you can uh, download them off of uh, wcatradio.com backslash vestments and uh, peruse them at your leisure if you so desire. So this week I'm going to start by talking about deacon vestments, um, many of which, many of the deacon vestments are also the same vestments that priests wear. Uh, the topic of vestments is much more complicated than what we were talking about last week, clericals, as there are so many more kinds. And within the Catholic families of rites and the many orders, there are so many modifications to the vestments. Um, and of course, we can't forget that they've also developed over time. So it really does make for a fascinating study. There are a couple of sources that you might be interested in if you are interested in vestments. Uh, the first is a site called www.everythingvestment.com. It is by a company that makes vestments. But on this site, I found some very interesting uh, reading material. Uh, people, um, you know, we... We go back uh, to the time of ancient Israel, and you know that sacred things are set aside for the one God, and certainly clothing is one of those things. However, as you read through that, uh, as you read through that uh, site, keep in mind that the Catholic vestments did not originate in ancient Judaism, although it did have some effects, but in secular dress in the ancient Greek and Roman world. However, that is a site that you might really be interested in uh, reading uh, because it does have quite a bit of information about, um, about what was going on in ancient Israel uh, early on, uh, long before the beginning of, you know, before Christ came. Also, any fashion encyclopedia online will also give you information. So if you go on the uh, internet and you do a search for fashion encyclopedia, uh, you will find several um, and, you know, go into them and just put in the name of a vestment and uh, you will get some information. Uh, I was kind of surprised to see that because I usually think of a fashion encyclopedia, which I have to tell you, I've not thought of it often. Uh, but when you look at a fashion encyclopedia, I thought it would be entirely secular but it's not. It also goes into uh, some of the uh, vestments. 
So to begin, in the Roman Rite, Latin ritual family, uh, the deacon's vestments are the alb, the amice, if it's required. And I will be talking about that uh, next week because it is usually required for priests. Stole, cincture, and dalmatic. The priest vestments are alb, amice, stole, cincture, and chasuble. So I'm going to be quoting at length uh, from Collins as his information is quite interesting. The easiest way to approach the subject matter is to discuss the original clothing, primarily of ancient Greece and Rome, that evolved into vestments. Those would be the tunic, the hymation, the cincture, and the dalmatic. The alb is the form of a form of the ancient tunic. Both deacons and priests wear an alb. Lay people can also wear an alb if they are leading a liturgical service, something like morning prayer, or at mass if they have an official role. It is an ankle length, ample white garment with sleeves, usually made of linen as it was in the ancient times. It is a symbol of purity. Uh, the tunic itself from which the alb comes is an interesting piece of clothing. I have heard it described as a potato sack with a hole cut for the head and two holes for the arms. It was originally very short, knee length at best. In the first century, the tunic was the first article of clothing that was put on in the morning. Working class people wore knee length, knee -length tunics while older people and people with less active occupations wore um, ankle length tunics. It was considered unsophisticated to wear a tunic without a cincture. The cincture performed as a belt, whether it was a piece of rope or a nice piece of fabric. That cincture is now worn around the alb and like the alb, it is a symbol of purity. But back to the tunic. The tunic was originally sleeveless. Greeks and Romans thought the sleeves were barbaric, and you probably remember this from last week. Uh, the Greeks and Romans thought sleeves were barbaric because barbarians wore them. Barbarians, meaning those people who came from colder climates, and as we can remember from last week, uh, the barbarians were in control of northern Italy when uh, these uh, vestments were starting to be developed. Tunics did not acquire sleeves until the third century, when the Roman Emperor Caracalla, who I also mentioned uh, last week, uh, came from a military campaign wearing a tunic with sleeves. So a modern alb has sleeves because we need to cover the street clothing that has sleeves. And I suspect the sleeves also perform the same function today as they did in the ancient past of keeping its wearer warm. As an aside, the Emperor Caracalla, who rolled, ruled from 193 to 211, whose real name was Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, Antoninus earned the nickname Caracalla because he loved the tunic with its sleeve, and that is what that tunic with sleeves was called, a Caracalla. He is considered one of the most bloodthirsty tyrants in the Roman Empire, which is really saying something. He and his brother ruled together for some time. After his father died, it is believed Caracalla had his brother killed uh, so that he would be the sole ruler. That really impressed me, not that he had his brother killed, but what impressed me is that every time you have someone put on an alb in the Catholic Church, uh, we are going into, we're putting on clothing that uh, was actually made popular uh, by a, a man who was a bloodthirsty killer. And yet God has taken that, uh, that clothing with the big sleeves uh, that this emperor loved and has made it a thing of holiness that people wear all the time. Um, so it really, I mean, it's a silly example. I know it's a simple example, but it shows us how God can take things that are not good and make something good from them. 
So uh, that's uh, a little aside about uh, Emperor Caracalla. Almost every man uh, wore the universal basic dress of antiquity, a single simple undergarment, the tunic, that covered the upper body and thighs. There was just two pieces of rectangular, rectangular wool cloth sewn together with holes for arms and head. In most cases, they didn't even have sleeves. They looked like ponchos. They often had two blue or purple stripes running down the shoulders to the bottom. This uh, can be compared to the tunics found in Israel, uh, which were colorful. Yellow, brown, and red uh, were the main colors. But we have to remember that dyeing anything, dyeing any cloth was an extra course. So poor rural laborers accordingly wore undyed cream colored tunics. Christ wore a tunic. There is a famous tradition about Jesus's tunic in John 19 verse 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. The undergarment was the tunic. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Here we learn that it was not sewn together from two sheets of fabric, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. In the first four centuries, people in the church were baptized in the nude. Um, I just let someone in. People were baptized in the nude. When they emerged from the water, they were immediately clothed in a white tunic. For this reason, the alb is a reminder of baptism and a symbol of the resurrection on the last day. An interesting historical perspective comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says the alb, the liturgical vestment worn in some services by Roman Catholic officiants, some Anglicans and uh, some Lutherans. A symbol of purity, it is full, a full length, long sleeve, usually white linen tunic secured at the waist by a cord or a belt called a cincture. Derived from the long white tunica, uh, alba or linea, commonly worn in the Greco-Roman world. The alb was retained by the Christian clergy as a vestment after secular styles began changing in the sixth century. It was the 10th century, the plain alb started to be decorated with embroidery on the hem and cuff, and it was later decorated with four or five rectangular patches of embroidery. These became less common in the 16th century and were replaced by lace, which eventually covered most of the garment. In the 20th century, with the Roman Catholic liturgical renewal, the plain white linen alb came back into use. I focused on this particular interesting historical perspective because as you recall last week, what I told you was that when the clothing changed for Catholics, it wasn't because we innovated into something new, it was because we remained with the old. And so the rest of the world moved on and added other clothing, different clothing, but we basically stayed wearing the same thing. And here we have the same thing the style started to change in the sixth century, but the Alp did not for Catholics, <clears throat> excuse me. In the 10th century, it did start to change because we added embroidery um, and lace. Anyone who has a leadership role in worship um, can wear an Alp and cincture, whether they are clergy or lay people. Only clergy wear a stole over the Alp. Both deacons and priests wear the cincture, which is made of cloth, usually flax, hemp, wool, or silk, or rope. If it is made of cloth, it can be white or of the color of the liturgical season. It is put around the waist like a belt and tied. The cincture represents chastity and continence. Since deacons tie the stole on the left, they usually tie the cincture on the right. So the alb, the cincture, uh, all of these things 
consistently going back to this representation of purity. In the first century, most people wore a hymation, a long rectangular piece of cloth worn by men and women over one or both shoulders, that is, over their tunics. This would be in ancient Greek, Greece. I'm admitting someone else here. Um, note the hymation never became a vestment. It would have been approximately 18 feet long. Scripture tells us that Jesus wore a hymation to the crucifixion. So remember, the soldiers took one piece of clothing and divided it into four pieces, and the other piece they cast lots for because it was woven in one piece. What the soldiers tore was the hymation. And it wasn't until I realized it was 18 feet long that I could realize how they would actually bother tearing it into four pieces. Okay, so the tunic remained in one piece, but the hymation became in four pieces. Now, Jesus's tunic would have been sleeveless and ankle length. It was the same kind of tunic that the high priest wore when he entered the Holy of Holies to atone for the sins of the people. We know that Jesus wore a hymation or cloak from scripture. So Matthew 9 verses 20 and 21, a woman suffering hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the tassel on his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I shall be cured. And Matthew 14 verses 35 and 36, when the men of the place recognized him, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought to him all those who were sick and begged him that they might touch only the tassel on his cloak, and as many as touched it were healed. His hymation would probably have tassels as required of Israelites. Remember that Jesus was born a Jew. See Numbers 15, verses 38 to 40, and Deuteronomy 22, verse 12. There's an interesting uh, YouTube video on hymation reconstruction, which I will be uh, giving to Dr. Mahfoud to put on his website. It's a YouTube video of uh, a man, fully clothed, uh, being dressed in the hymation and it shows how it's done by a person walking around them and around them and around them. And then finally at the end, the hymation goes over the left arm and the person puts the left arm against the clothing and that holds everything in place. So uh, it's a very interesting hymation. The music's a little weird, but you can't have everything. Anyway, so if you get a chance to watch it, I think it's well worth watching. The Dalmatic is worn by deacons, not priests. Uh, you know, the priests wear the chasuble. So the de deacons wear the dalmatic. It is a garment that in the first century, the upper classes wore over their tunics. By the third century in the Roman Empire, it was elaborately decorated and worn by both sexes. Now it looks more like a loosely fitted tunic, like a surplus in shape except that it is plain and not necessarily white. If the deacon is wearing a dalmatic, it can go over or under the stole. It can be the color for the liturgical season. Now a surplus, on the other hand, is a very lightweight, blouse-like garment with sleeves. It's almost invariably white and it often has lace trim. I've seen some of them that you would basically think were made out of lace. There was so much lace on them. A surplus is only worn over a cassock, never by itself, and never over an alb. It is actually a type of alb designed to be worn over a cassock. It is usually loose fitting, linen or cotton, with loose sleeves, and the body of the uh, blouse reaches to the knees. The stole is worn by deacons and priests, although worn differently. It is narrow. It is a narrow rectangular garment, usually seven to nine feet long and four inches wide. It is worn around the neck so that it hangs down in front of the wearer's legs, ending below the knee. 
the stole merges the functions of two different things. First, ancient governments, government officials, wore a stole, just as today the police officer wears a badge. Second, slaves used to wear a work cloth around their neck for polishing things or from wiping sweat from their faces. In the church, the, the stole functions as a badge of office to mark the wearer as ordained clergy. It can also function as a cloth that the celebrant, the priest, used to clean the communion wear as part of the service. For these reasons, the stole became a Eucharistic garment. The stole is a symbol of immortality. It is given to a man when he is ordained as a deacon or a priest. Modern stoles are usually the appropriate color for the liturgical season. Only ordained clergy wear a stole. A deacon, obviously someone who is ordained, can also wear a stole but it is customary for a deacon to wear it over his left shoulder tied at the waist on the right side so that the stole hangs diagonally across his chest. A stole can be over, worn over a robe, an alb, or a cassock. If a deacon combines an alb, dalmatic, and stole, the alb goes on first, and then the dalmatic, and then the stole on top. To close, there's a beautiful article that I found on the internet that I think uh, is interesting uh, by a Father Michael Van Sloan, who's a pastor of St. Bartholomew Catholic Church in Minnesota. And he talks about the symbols of the deacon. And I thought, you know, it's, it's really uh, very interesting what the important symbols are that are associated with the deacons. There's only several, but the first is the deacon stole. The deacon stole is the most distinguishing and recognizable symbol of the office of the deacon. It's an item of vesture or liturgical attire, attire worn over the alb and under the dalmatic if it is used. It is placed over the left shoulder and extends diagonally across the front and back of the upper body and attaches near the right hip. Two strips hang from the right hip, one to the front, the other to the back, and both fall equally to below the knee. It is used when the deacon exercises a liturgical or sacramental role in church, such as when he assists at mass, presides for a baptism, or conducts a funeral service. The stole itself is a piece of fabric, usually about four and a half inches wide and 55 to 60 inches long on each side. Some stoles are beautifully decorated with spiritual symbols, while others are simple, plain, and elegant. Some have tassels on the end, others do not. Deacon stoles come in all of the liturgical colors, and the one worn on a particular day is to match the liturgical occasion. The second important symbol of the deacon is a basin and a towel. I know that sounds like two, but I guess they go together. A basin and a towel. The diaconate is an order of service, and the basin and the towel were used by Jesus for the foot washing, if you look at John 13, verse 4 and 5. It is a profound symbol of the humble service that Jesus gave to his disciples and of the humble service the deacon intends to give to the people of God. After Jesus completed his task, he told his disciples, I have given you a model to follow so that as I have done for you, you shall also do. That's John 13, verse 15. And the deacon's response is to be a servant who will freely and gladly give service in imitation of his Savior. The third symbol is the cross. Another major symbol of the diaconate is the cross itself, sometimes a rough or gnarly one to represent the great challenges associated with service. The foot washing prefigured Jesus' definitive act of service, his total gift of self, his death on the cross, which makes the cross the ultimate symbol of service. Jesus made a conscious and deliberate decision to serve in this manner. No one takes it, meaning my life, from me, but I lay it down on my own. 
That's John 10, verse 18. For Jesus, the cross represented his supreme act of loving service. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. And that's John 15, verse 13. The deacon, thus inspired by Jesus, makes a conscious decision to pick up his cross and follow in Jesus' footsteps to lay down his life in service by assisting at the altar but also, and more importantly, to love God by serving his neighbor, particularly with acts of charity. And last, the dalmatic, the outer vestment sometimes worn by a deacon over the alban stole, compared to the priest chasuble, is sometimes also considered a symbol of the diaconate. So, first thing I wanted to just uh, make people aware of, there are prayers that... Mm -hmm. uh, can be and should be said when vesting mm -hmm. um and i have that and i could send this uh to doctor so that if you wanted to post it so people could see sure. that but sure, that for, each, for each article of of the clothing of the vestment there was a separate prayer for it now interestingly on the list that i have the one article that you didn't mention that's on here and as a deacon i don't use it i've only seen it used in latin right masses and that's the maniple yeah which goes yeah. over the arm mm -hmm. so there is a there is a prayer for that yes also mm -hmm. and uh, these prayers are both in latin and english so Good. i don't do yeah the, the if latin. you'd copy them and send them to me i'd appreciate sure. it yeah no problem mm -hmm. so i wanted i wanted to show um see if i could do this um i have some of my vestments here i don't have a lot uh newly ordained and i don't have that many but this is an alb mm -hmm. um this is the one i wear most often it does have some lace on the sleeves mm -hmm. and on the on the bottom mm -hmm. of it. um this one just is with velcro so it goes yeah. over me very nicely fits nicely and um and it has and then this is the cincture that i usually wear um which is not a very long one, right. but I like it. And there are different ways of tying the cinture. Yes. I've seen, particularly priests will will do it where they'll do a double loop, mm -hmm. and then they'll put their stole in sometimes, and then they'll bring the loop yeah. out. But I just simply uh, wrap it around my waist and then knot it and then let the, the cord mm -hmm. hang down. Mm -hmm. And I do have... Um, only one Dalmatic, and that's my diocesan Dalmatic, um, which you can see it has the sleeves. Mm -hmm. This one has the uh, the symbol for uh, Norwich Diocese on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has the sleeves, which um, the Dalmatics have. And so then I brought some of my stoles um, that I have. Um, this one, of course, I wear most often because of ordinary time, the Sure. Green one. It's but I. It's a beautiful one too. It and is. It is reverse. It is reversible because it. You could have the white mm -hmm. on the other side. Sure. So that's one I wear most often. Mm -hmm. And this one, uh, my wife actually made for me. It's a oh, nice. Marian, a Marian stole. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's got the beautiful Marian symbol on it. It's blue mm -hmm. and white. Mm -hmm. So I have had the opportunity to wear that a couple of times. Nice. And uh, this one was made, I have a relative uh, that married into a Hmong family. Hmongs mm -hmm. from like Cambodia and Thailand. Sure. So they made me this vestment and it has um, fringes. I mean, it's all beadwork mm. um, that they actually handmade that. So that's that was wow. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I was in, I had the opportunity to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I was in Jerusalem, and I was at, there was a wonderful gift shop at um, the church in Jerusalem, St. Peter in Galicanto, which is uh, Coxcrow, so it's, they have a beautiful statue of um, St. Peter outside of it, but um, when I, they had a beautiful stole there, and, but I went, when I went to buy it, there 
uh, credit card machine was down and wasn't working. So I said, oh, well, I won't be getting that. And then I let we left there. And then I went into the, the old city walking around and I found my tour guide. And I asked him if he knew somebody that made a stole. And he said he did. And uh, because a lot of the stoles that are in the shops in Jerusalem are just basic stoles. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found my way down this alleyway and found my way to this tailor and he wasn't home. So I waited a little <laughs> while. I left him a note, told him what I was looking for. And then I left and I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to the gift shop. And sure enough, when I went back there, the credit card machine was working and I was able to purchase this mm -hmm. beautiful purple stole. And it has um, beautiful uh, fish and loaves on it. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, the Jerusalem cross on it. And then when I was leaving the hotel uh, the next day, um, there was a message for me that the tailor had gotten my message and he actually left me um, a stole uh, mm. before I left in Jerusalem. And that was this one here, the screen one that's mm. handmade in Jerusalem. Nice. It is beautiful. So again, all these are worn over my left shoulder. Mm-hmm. And then they hang down and they usually tied or clasped on the right side. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh. And um, we do have a new pastor at our church and he told me he's going to be probably getting me some new vestments and some uh, Dalmatics. So nice. That'll be nice. Well, thank you for showing everybody those things. They're, they're just beautiful. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And just, um, uh, if I'm going to events where I'm not, uh, not, not participating in mass or nothing liturgical, but I want to be known that I'm a deacon, um, our diocese uh, does not encourage deacons to wear uh, clerics or collars. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. though some some do um, but I do have a couple of shirts with the deacon symbol on it which is the cross mm -hmm. with the so stole that goes mm -hmm. uh, on a diagonal on that so I, mm -hmm. I will wear those so that people will know uh, that I'm a deacon mm -hmm. very good well thank you for doing that I appreciate sure. it it always helps when we can actually see the real thing when we're talking about it right. so mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Tulin Wilson, for your presentation tonight. Uh, next week is priestly vestments. Mm -hmm. So if there are um, any priests who would like to bring vestments. Uh, that would be very nice. We welcome to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any closing uh, thoughts? Uh, Dominic um, is going to close us in prayer. But before he does, do you have any uh, summary thoughts, uh, Dr. Tulin Wilson? Uh I think basically the uh, the summary thought I have is how beautiful it is that we have um, ordained people that are uh, here for service. You know, um, it's you know it's it really is something when you think of people helping other people, um, not because it's just something that they want to do, but because it's something that's ingrained in their vocation. Um, so I think that that is beautiful, but that's, uh, my last thought for the night. Thank you, Dr. Tulin Wilson. Uh, Dominic, would you close us in prayer? Oh, and you're muted. Uh, you're, you're muted. You want to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for this important conference. We continue to invite you to lead us, to guide us. We thank you for the gift of life. We pray for Dr. Cynthia, for the input that he's given us for our understanding. We pray that whatever we have received, we'll be able to embrace it and to enforce it, to bring a beautiful liturgy into play for people to really appreciate and experience your presence in the liturgical celebrations. We pray for each one of us 
and we pray for all the church that give us the wisdom, the needed support that we need to educate ourselves about the treasures that you have given to your church, that we will become aware of what you are supposed to do. We pray for the conferences that we are about to receive. We pray for good health for the Cynthia and the organizers of this program. We pray for each and every one that the next week we'll be able to nourish ourselves with a beautiful liturgical activity that you have blessed your church with. We are this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful prayer, Dominic. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll see everybody next week. It's the same link, same time, same day. Uh, God bless you. And I'll post uh, the recording of today's session on uh, uh, wcatradio.com slash vestments. God bless you, everyone. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you.